Emma Sale founded a business called Killing Kittens. And Killing Kittens was a first mover in the millennial female empowerment movement. And it's kind of swept up social media and popular culture, including female first dating apps like Bumble and kind of the Me Too hashtag. And she's very much at the, at the forefront of that. I had a chat with Emma. Uh, she came to our offices um, just off uh, Commercial Street. And it was a fascinating conversation. We focused a little bit on her background. We also discussed how she got the idea for Killing Kittens and why it's important to be so, if you like, pro-publicity with a business like that and an organisation like that. Um, she's very cognizant of the fact that she's a mum, she's a business person, and she has this business. We then also obviously asked her those questions about what she knows about youth culture. And we asked Emma Sale of Killing Kittens, what was her rocket fuel? So Emma, it seems crazy that we've got to this stage in the series of these podcasts about youth culture, about youth marketing, without talking about sex, doesn't it? It is, given that that sort of drives everyone, really. <laughs> um, let's, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, let's start with a little bit about your journey. Um, how have you got to where you are now and what does your current role involve? Um, so my journey, I, I launched um, this company, Killing Kittens, in 2005. So I think I was 24, around 24. Um, and it wasn't, when I look back at sort of the whys, um, it wasn't sort of a sudden thing. I grew up, um, I had a real mishmash childhood. I grew up living in the Middle East um, with a, a very controlling father. Um, and I was at an all-girls boarding school for 10 years in England. Um, and at school, I sort of was um, taught that I could rule the world and go out and be whatever I wanted to be. And then at home was sort of the complete opposite going on the culture I was living in, the home life um, on that front. Um, and I sort of, this whole kind of mixed going on sort of fueled that fire in my belly, which I always say whenever you start anything, you, it's that passion and there's something in you that just builds up until you go enough. I want to fix something. Um, and then started in PR and went into financial PR um, and had some bad sort of sexual harassment experiences with just guys, um, directors um, that I was working for. And things that you sense wouldn't happen nowadays? Or yeah, things no, that they you would. Probably I, would. I think it's still, you know, it's still happening. I'm not talking about, you know, full on rape or anything like that, but just really inappropriate um, behavior that makes you feel cheap and you know it shouldn't be happening, but you're young. You know, I was 20, 21, hmm. um, and these are guys in positions of power that you don't say, when you're that little, you don't say anything. Okay. Um, and when I did complain, I was told that, you know, to be very careful because I'd be seen as a troublemaker. Um, and so again, this it just kept fueling this fire. And at the same time, I was watching Sex and the City that had come out and, uh, you know, in society and summer sort of hit the high street, the sex stores, um, the fair, you know, Lido had the vibrators and Selfridges went in there. Um, and it's sort of, the media were talking about this sort of female sexual revolution um, going on. And again, and I at that point had moved into the freelance PR for, um, in entertainment and I um, was doing the PR for the Big Erotica show. Okay. Um, and I just found it all run by men and all the brands within it, from porn to sex toys, lingerie, were sort of, they were all claiming to be female friendly, but it was all very much run by men. Okay. Um, and I got looking at it all and, you know, they wanted to make things more female friendly. And it just sort of, then it sort of hit the differences between women and sex and men and sex. And, um, and that fire <laughs> that had been burning just suddenly went, right, enough. Um, there's no space or safe space for women to explore their sexuality, be it online, offline, um, non-judgmental areas, um, to be completely in control and be whatever they want to be. Because in sort of all around me, girlfriends, if they were having one night stands, they were judged. Guy friends of mine would say, oh, you know, I've met a really cool girl 
but she's not girlfriend material because she slept mm. with all these guys. And I'd be like, well, why? Mm. Why is it all right for you to sleep with loads of girls and be boyfriend material? Yeah. Um, so it just, and then, and then to be honest, I was at a wedding in Ibiza and it was sort of a three day bender. Mm. Um, and well done. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's where all the good ideas come from. Um, <laughs> And someone phoned in who couldn't make the wedding and said to the groom, are you, is everyone just sat around killing kittens at the moment? <laughs> and we had this conversation um, about what, and, it, and it's every time you masturbate, God kills a kitten. <laughs> so if you, if you have a wank, then you're killing a kitten. Um, and I went, right, that's it. That's what I'm calling the business. And um, I, I want, you know, from day one, it was very much, I want to provide, you know, on and offline community where women are very much in control and it's about them exploring their sexuality and not be judged and feel safe and um so that's where killing kittens was born wow. um yeah and you've been running it for about 10 years yeah 14 14 14, 14 wow. years and okay. it was very much offline to start with because i mean it was 2005 it was pre the digital media world really mm. it wasn't really i think facebook kind of was about then but yeah. it was sort of very much word of mouth and old school networking okay Let's focus on you. Who do you like to surround yourself with in the workplace? What qualities um, do you look for in colleagues? Do you know what? We had a, um, we had like a team summer party at Oran. Everyone came to my house two days ago. And, it, um, um, and my husband actually said it's, it's, it's like a big family. Mm. Um, and there are like 14 of us. And it's sort of, and everyone's joined at different times. But, you know, I very much, everything I do is, is there is community and family. And you put that effort in and you see people as people and yeah. that's and i just find if you give that to people and that allow that sense of belonging call them my, you know the tribe um then you know they'll stay and they'll be happy and so i mean loyalty is a big thing it's yeah. a massive thing for me and again that comes in the family yeah. you know i've grown up with a massive family mm. and i've got 17 first cousins wow. um um so it's sort of that's just been my entire life and have you a mentor or have you ever mentored anybody? Um, I've, I've got some mentees. So I've, mm -hmm. I've mentored some people and some girls who have started businesses, you know, in the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they check in with me sometimes and I'll, you know, meet up with them for coffees and drinks and stuff. And, and I love it. I think I never really had a mentor. Um, and, you know, I look back and it would have been nice to have that because, I mean, I launched in a very male world. Yeah. Um, and it was only really men in the industry mm. and I got a lot of flack and, but I mean, I'm so bloody minded and stubborn <laughs> um, that actually the more flack I got, the more I was like, right, sodgy, I'm going to prove you wrong and do it. <laughs> Would you say that's what you're known for? Your bloody mindedness and your stubbornness or um, what else are you known for? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that, yeah, the bloody mind, well, just the stuff the, I'm going to, that drive, that the kind of grit, a lot of people and friends, you know, have said they never thought I'd carry on doing it or it would last or, um, you know, with all the crap I got at the beginning that I would actually stick it out. So, okay. yeah. And are you any good at switching off, Emma? No. You've, surely, <laughs> you might, we were talking just before we started recording, you've got three young children. Yeah. Surely that... If it doesn't help you switch off, it you helps know, you switch into a different I mode. I switch into a different mode. I have okay. different I have different hats and I'm very good at switching between the two. So when I'm in work mode, then I don't think about the mum mode. Mm -hmm. um, and and when I'm in mum mode, I try and put the phone down and ignore it, have it on silent, and I'm very much in mum mode. If I were to meet you, <laughs> or if uh, here we go the mum the other mums of at the nursery that yeah. your kids go to what do you tell them that you do what do you do know you... what the um they all know i mean I, mm. we have it's a joke in our in our family at the minute sort of i get befriended by someone on facebook it's that here we go <laughs> <laughs> you just know the minute you hit that accept yeah then you know because my facebook is sort of covered in a mix of kid stuff um and a mix of work stuff so you can't miss it yeah um and, and actually, do you know, I've had lots of mums, you know, nursery mums and, and nursery, you know, managers and stuff who sort of high five it and say it's great. And, um, cause that's the thing. It, it's sort of, it's the modern world now. It's society's changed. It's a lot more, di it's a lot different to when I launched it 14 years ago and got asked that the yeah. question. And I remember saying, 
you know, I don't have kids and never people were like, well, what are you going to say when they, you do at the school gates? And mm. I, my answer was always, was, well, I'd hope and I'd expect society to have changed so that actually it's become normal and yeah. socially acceptable and I'll be the coolest mum on the block. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, it was always my answer. <laughs> Okay, so section two um, of our conversation is going to be around your business. We'll come on to some of the other businesses and some yeah. of the other things you've looked at. But let's focus on killing kittens first of yeah. all. You've explained the genesis of the name. What does it? What are the aims of the business? What do you want to achieve? Um, so with the business, we you know want uh, to become sort of the global, the big, you know, the biggest sort of female empowerment brand in the world really, um, both on and offline. So, you know, in my mind sort of take so House meets Playboy. Okay. Really. <laughs> and it's, how does it manifest itself? What people join you with a membership? People are... Um, yeah, so we are, we're actually, and people don't really realize, we're sort of considered a tech business okay. now because over 50% of our revenue comes from the, our technology. Um, so we've got 120,000 members online. Um, and you, to attend any of our events, you have to register to be a member. There are different forms of membership. Even celebrities have to go through yeah, that yeah. post, do we've they? Got, we've You're got quite some, strict, We've got you? celebs on there. Okay. Um, they might not upload photos. Sure. They might just get emailed um, to make sure they are the real people. Yeah. Um, but they have to pay membership the same as everyone else. No one gets a free pass. Um, and it's a series of parties throughout the year that they have the opportunity to attend. Yeah, That's so um, we have the full-on Killing Kittens parties which are sort of masked and there is sex that does go on if i would say that's a byproduct if you want to do it you can there's okay. areas um but then over 50 percent of our of our events um are i call them you know the pg-13 um mm. ones which are the talks the workshops panel debates that you know we have sanctuary weekends couple weekends um retreats um sort of day workshops so there's a very much um a big educational hard to do it and that's the side we're massively growing and um, that's just sort of in London at the moment right um, but we're taking that and into sort of the webinar um, space so that actually you can be anywhere and and get, attend the workshops so would you say that sex and sexuality is still at the core of the killing kitten yeah brand? very much you so would. so sexuality and sort of owning that sexuality but when it comes to women you know our biggest sex organ is our brain okay um, so you can't just and that's why one reason why I launched I was watching sort of People in that in the adult space and sort of the porn industry, it's sort of brightly lit porn films, mm. and guys are sort of instantly turned on, and that's fine for them. Whereas women, it's sort of nothing when you watch that. And mm. actually, to me, it was more that you then it's the touch, the feel, the smell, the ambience, the everything except sex is what turns a woman on. Okay. Um, and that the brain part is sort of if you're not feeling confident, um, and you've you know you've had a bad day, or you're feeling insecure, then there's not any part of you that's going to want to actually have sex. Um, and what age ranges are members of the Killing Kittens? Um, so it's we it's 18 upwards. Okay. Um, but we have to be careful because we operate, obviously, in the US. Mm. Um, and so the online side is 18. Um, but the events, some of the full-on events we do in New York, it's obviously it's 21. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, you combine with the alcohol laws out there. And, sure. Um, so, yeah, the site is 18 plus. Okay. And how do people respond to the Killing Kittens parties now versus when you were first started? Um, so when we first started, um, it was sort of very hush. Hush. People didn't admit it to their friends. Yeah. It was sort of they really wanted it to be secret. They couldn't be seen to be going or linked or anything like that whereas now people i hear people openly talk about it right um and take friends down okay and they go in groups or and, and um you know they'll admit to friends they'll say oh, we were at a kk party last night and the big the big change i've seen actually is is single girls mm. so what was very much sort of 50 50 at the beginning um and every man has to be accompanied to these parties um but it was still sort of 50 50 is we're getting if it's a party with 200 people 50 single girls in that right um so it's gone the single girls attending and being open to it and actually admitting to their friends and this is who we are and you know we're single so what um, and, and you see that as a progression of society massively yeah. because it's that you know the whole what's happened with women um i think as a whole is that independence and that 
owning ourselves and being in control of ourselves and that and that you know it's okay to actually do what we want when we want <laughs> and what does killing kittens as a brand mean to your members what do you think what if is there a commonality between the members and what do you think the killing kittens brand is um, i think and this is sort of we've opened up massively the last two years on the digital side so we've you know the blog and um people joining the site have to say why and what it's done for them and actually you know i use that term and you know the empowerment brand just now, but a lot of that has come from what we get is that is they'll say it's empowered us. It's you know they might have been in bad relationships, they might have not been confident in themselves. It, it's empowered them to actually go. Do you know what we're going to own it and own us and um, and who cares what anyone thinks on okay. that front? And talk to me a big broad question now, Emma. Yeah. What what role does and what role should sex and sexuality play? in the lives of young people? Um, I think I think it's massive and I, you know, I'm a big believer and, you know, starting to do more actually on the educational front as in grassroots. Mm. Um, because I very much believe that it starts from, you know, I've got a four and a half year old boy and a two and a half year old girl and we've already started. Yeah. You've all we've already started having those the conversations and that you know, even the pinks and blues and, mm. you know, well, girls don't play sport. It's mm. sort of, you know, that it, it's so easy, actually, to have that subconscious bias that yep. you do without thinking. They're girls, they're boys. Um, and so, you know, we've, you know, we've started as parents on that front, but also um, um, starting to, you know, be more outspoken and, and talk, trying to get do more on the education front, on the sex ed and that side, because it's normalising it. Because actually our sexuality, your sexuality makes you the person that you are and runs how you operate. It's the basic animal in us that you can't deny. And do you think that's different for men than it is for women? I don't think it's, I don't think it's any different. Our sexuality drives us. Mm. And if we can't be who we feel we are, then we're not going to be happy. I don't know where I stand on this <laughs> particular topic, but how should women use their sexuality in their lives, if at all? So in the workplace, for example, it, w would you you're partly involved in this education yeah. space and this empowerment space. Do you think that women should use their sexuality in the workplace? I don't think, I don't think you need to, people, anyone needs to use their sexuality to get anywhere right. in life. I think it's just what drives us. Okay. Um, and it's what makes us, you know, the animals and the human, you know, it makes us who we are. Yeah. So, but I don't think anyone, and it's the same with, you know, men in positions of power using that sexuality and that to push it onto women and that sexual harassment front. It's sort of, I don't think either sex should use it. And I've seen, you know, overly sexual women trying to really, you know, use it on men. Right. Which I don't think is right. Okay. Um, Let's talk about Me Too just for mm. a second. Um, where do you think we are with the Me Too movement? Do you think it's long overdue? Do you think there's a million miles still to travel? Um, I think it, it was long overdue. It needed to happen. I think it lit a fire um, under the, you know, global female bellies. Um, and yeah, it's something needed to happen. Something needed to change. And even I, you know, me and so many friends sort of, when it started and when you got chatting, when, well, nothing ever happened to us. You know, we haven't seen it. And then the more you chat, you go, actually... That happened, mm. and that happened, yeah, and that's not right, yeah. And even guy friends of mine were going, yeah, that wasn't right, mm. that wasn't, you know, it sort of it needed to happen on that front. Um, I think there has been women jumping on the bandwagon. Mm. I think there's been some unfair behaviour from women, yeah. Um, but I think in the main, as a whole, it's a good, it's a good thing. What I don't like, and it's same with you know that the feminists that are the man bashing feminists, yeah, and the them and us. I think, I don't think anger helps anything. Okay. Um, I think it's just highlighted it and made people more aware, both sexes, um, and made women more vocal about what they want and their rights and, you know, we deserve this and actually we should have the same. So you're, it should be said that only for the, to contextualise my next question, you're an, you're an XPR, so yeah. you understand... <laughs> the kind of value exchange between journalists, content yeah. creators. 
I read a few interviews with you um, in preparation for this interview. For the most part, they were wildly positive and people got what I think mm. you're trying to do. Some people dismissed the entire Killing Kittens as a great big shag fest. Yeah. As, as an excuse for people to get their oh, yeah, kicks. Oh, yeah, they were on. Mainly men. Yeah, so go on. <laughs> put, this is what I want. Push back for us. Um, Help us. In- do you know, it's been like that from the start. And um, a lot of the pushback I've said from day one, a lot of the pushback I've had, and quite angry pushback, people being really angry to my face, has been sort of alpha males um, who don't, A, they don't get it, sex is sex to them. Um, it's also they're used to being completely in control and having the power and it being all about them from them being single going into bars picking up women it's all on their terms Um, and I'm doing what I'm doing and have done since day one and it's nothing about them so this goes back to your overarching brand ethos of liberating women because there's the tectonic plates are shifting you're 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 giving more power the Balance yeah, that. and that's what you think is responsible for the backlash. Yeah, massively, and it's yeah, emasculating. You know, there are some men that feel emasculated by it, and and you know, it, the same. The whole Me Too movement actually has, I call it the angry white male. Yeah, um, has created that, and it, it is that. They're, it's been all about them, with them having control, him, them having the power, and suddenly it's sort of shifted. And I mean, there's been a, a rise of sexual assaults in London, with police not really knowing why. Um, to me, it's fairly obvious. A, there's Me Too going on, so women are reporting it more. Yeah. And B, you've got the angry white male. Yeah. <laughs> going okay. on. So, so um, it's that yeah, toxic it's just, mix. It's yeah. a toxic mix of, you know, you, you may, if anyone feels insecure, and, um, and it's the same with bitchy females, you know, the more insecure a female is, you know, the bitchy nutter comes <laughs> out. <laughs> so just what I'm thinking out loud, there's a huge scope for mm. somebody to come along and do what you've done with sex, sexuality and, and women and liberating mm. women, there's almost scope for people to do that for men and with men in a responsible way. Yeah, well, actually, we do. Um, you know, we very much have included men from day one. And I'm, you know, I love men. And mm. it, to me, it's working together mm. and partnerships and, and but understanding how each other works. That's the thing. And not expecting men to think or behave like women and not expecting women to think or behave like men um and the so we we actually do talks men only talks and men only workshops where it's just men and it uh, all of them are sort of about educating and helping them understand what's going on and they come so for example there's a inspiring women conference at management today Mm. working on and 80 to 90% of the delegates are women. This battle is only truly won when men are going yeah, to completely. feminist events. But you're having success with We that. have all our events on day one, from the full-on getting kittens parties to, you know, the talks, the educational side, include men. Yeah. And that's our me- online membership is men. The single men can be members. They right. just, their rules are on, online. Are, they have to sort of wait for the women to do the approaching. So it just keeps it. There's none of that CD okay. sex pest. Cool. Um, going on so everything you know everything we do has been very much inclusive of men um it's just yeah we have women at the core are there other brands you look out there and admire so it seems to me like within the ethos bumble have something of a perhaps a debt to pay to you however knowingly or unknowingly are there, are there other brands out yeah there? i mean i mean bumble are part of our, our tech platform actually it's the big has a big dating element to it and mm. that's growing and growing so sort of the way bumble operates on the dating front is you know, it's, it's, we've got that too yeah. as well. Um, and, you know, I've watched all the dating apps. But again, you know, a lot, but a lot of that actually, because I'm quite an offline person, mm. um, which is ironic when it's a tech business now. Um, mm. But I'm very old school. I'm very face-to-face and that human interaction. Um, so everything we do, even if it's all, even our online stuff, is very much pushing people to meet offline. Okay. Um, and so, you know, all the dating stuff actually i don't think they i think it's great it's you know the digital world mm. it's you change the dating world but i think the whole swipe swipe side of things sort of instantly dehumanizes people and you just become a thing yeah and i don't think it does anyone's confidence <laughs> any good <laughs> um in terms of recruiting new members how how do new people come to find the brand campus? um so just i mean to start with it was very much as i said that it was before social media really when we launched mm. um and digital marketing so it was very word of mouth and actually old school press 
So, you know, okay. it, it was newspapers and magazines, that kind of side of things. And um, um, there still is the media side um, of it. And people read about it. There's still very much the word of mouth. And, you know, we do the digital, we, we've now, you know, we've got all the social media stuff going on. Um, so, yeah. How, I'll tell you what, actually, Emma, let me ask another question. What mistakes have killing kittens made, if any, in your journey? Um, do you know what? It's funny. Someone asked me last week, saying what? what failures have you had and I just think that's my mindset I went oh, well, I don't we haven't failed and then I look back and go well that concept didn't work that concept didn't yeah. work um so it's more I don't think there's been any sort of big mistakes um I think I well I should have had an accountant much earlier on mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah there'd be more money in the bank in okay. the original years um and also I, I've got much more um not wary of people, much more closed. I used to sort of believe, every, I was very, I am very trusting. Um, and I've now, business-wise, I'm, I've become not, which I think is good and needed. Um, whereas out of business, I'm still very trusting. Okay. Um, so when I started, I, it was, I believed everything that came out of everyone's mouths. And, yeah. um, and in, the, in the nature of the beast and the world I operate in, and the mm. adult industry, there's a lot of bullshitters. Yeah. Um, and sleaze yeah. and guys offering, you know, mm. money, left, mm. front, centre. And um, so I had a lot of bullshit and wasted a lot of time. And where, <laughs> where next for the Killing Kittens brand? It strikes me as that this education piece and events piece is, is a, a new thing that you're investing a lot of traction in. It looks like you're, you've moved it to be a tech business first. What will happen next? Um, yeah, so our new platform went live this year and we've done a, we're just about to close a funding round. Um, we're doing a big Series A investment raise next year. Um, and part of that is we're looking at, you know, our own properties and things. So, wow. um, yeah, so there is that side of it. So stupid question, but I bet it illustrates a point. Hmm. Who are your typical Series A investors? Are they men or are they women? Do um, men get it? Do you know what's, what's interesting? So we did our first raise last year hmm. and we went down the Cedars crowd route sure. in the end um, because we're everything's about community. So just the big, getting big VCs yeah. wasn't... Um, and so big VCs, just for the listener listening, are big potential investors that yeah, we invest that, a that lot. That might so. bring, yeah, we'll bring big sort of what they call tickets in. Yeah. So the hundred grand plus type. Whereas um, the uh, crowdsourcing is a site a a crowd cube. You yeah. can put a tenner in and you might get some benefit as yeah. well as a sense of ownership. In yeah, the exactly. And and we wanted to very much it to be community. And I, you know, said we want 400 people thinking they own a bit mm. of killing kittens rather than have five city boys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> going around saying, oh, we own an orgy company. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> that is what uh, I was yeah. getting to, And we've yeah. just done a small <laughs> raise now just to carry on the tech before we do the big one next year. Um, and actually what we found this, you know, this time around, there's a lot more women okay. um, investing in it and putting their name to it because you, you're either anonymous or you put, list your name on, mm. on Cedars. Um, and we've actually got, you know, I've got a couple of meetings today actually with women who are responsible for funds, VC funds or private equity funds, and they're looking, um, they're specifically out to look at sex tech and femtech. And okay. so it's sort of, it has moved, even in the last year, there's been a big shift. Let's very briefly, because we've spoken loads about our business and I'm keen to get to mm. your rocket fuel, but let's talk about, if you're happy to, Safe Date and the Sisterhood. Yeah. <laughs> um, where should we start? Um, let's um, start with Safe Date. Okay. Tell us about that. Um, so Safe Date's an app um, which actually started when we were building the our new the new Killing Kittens site. It was a technology that we were just building into that, and it came about in our big chat groups, the female only chat groups on the site. Um, and girls were we we're finding that girls were um, saying we're going on this Tinder date or Bumble date, and this is where we're going. And if we haven't checked back into this group, then these are the details and send out a search party. And right. I think a lot of people have done that. Mm. Yeah, you know, I've messaged one friend saying, you know, if we don't, if you don't hear from us, come find us. Um, and we said, well, we need that technology in our new site that actually you can check into the into the okay. site and with all the details and with safe people. Um, and then the more we chatted, we said, well, actually. If we have it in the site, then it's sort of 18 plus, but actually it's the kind of app that 10 year olds need yep. and parents need for school kids. Um, and so we've, we've done it as a standalone app called Safe Date. Um, 
And you put in every, all the details of where you're going, who, where you found them, their usernames and everything on whatever you know. And then you put the say your safe people, you can have as many as you want and their, their numbers, email addresses. And you put a time you want to check back into the app. Um, and then you'll get a warning, a couple of warnings. Yeah. Um, you need to check back in. And then if you don't check back in, then your safe people get a message saying so-and-so had you down as a safe person. This is where they were. These are the details. So that is very simple. Wow, it's really um, clever. Really clever. Yeah, so we are, yeah, launched that last summer. And, and loads of applications, as you say, yeah. Mm. And yeah. that's the thing. So we're extending it and we're putting it into WhatsApp and um, yeah. adding loads of stuff to it. Well done, you. Um, <laughs> let's also have a brief chat about the sisterhood because it sounds fun. This is a, the yin to my yang. It, um, so I kind of started the sisterhood. Again, it was a drunk thing. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's yeah, a thing Yeah, there always is, exactly. Um, around the same time as kittens, actually, and it was a group of guys who had done a race and they'd call themselves the Brotherhood and they said they wanted to go across the English Channel and I went, right, sod it, I'm going to launch the sisterhood and we'll race you across. Um and then, so that's how it started. We raced across the English Channel and Dragon Boats. Um, and and you I, did it successfully? We did it, exactly. Amazing. Um, they won by 11 minutes, which I think was a good effort for yeah, us girls. Yeah, really good effort. Um, I think if we'd, we didn't want to win, mm, really. Fine. No one wants to do that <laughs> to many, male egos. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it's just grown from there. Now it's a big, again, community of women across all different sectors. Um, and we do loads of crazy different sports races all around the world um, every time for various different charities. I think we're coming up to nearly a million pound raised wow. since we launched. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this year, we, as a group of us ran from L.A. to Vegas, relayed, and then four of us relayed around the channel. It's sort of, it's just, but we, we do balls and social events and have oh, a big great. chat group. That, and it, but the chat group is really open, so it's kind of a support group. As well, and it's everything from like postnatal depression to anxiety, um, it's imposter syndrome. It's sort of yeah, yeah it's just a dumping ground um, in this WhatsApp group that people just yeah. So that's what sister did. So I'm still here with Emma Sale from Killing Kittens and. We've had a long-ranging discussion thus far covering your role, covering a bit of background to you. The point of this podcast, if indeed there is a point, is partly mm. to get to meet wonderful people, but it's also to get kind of practical, actionable insights mm -hmm. from my guests that are listener base, working in youth marketing, tech, commerce, youth culture, those sort of spaces, can get can glean some insights from you that they can uh, action in their everyday life. And we call that your rocket fuel. So Emma, what one thing do you know about youth audiences or young people? Um, one thing I do know, and mainly from, you know, I've got lots of friends who have teenage kids of various sexes. The, the, to them, it's not, uh, when it comes to, you know, the sexuality side of things, it's very, so different to how it was and actually, they don't really know much of a difference. They've sort of grown up and with actually girls and boys doing very similar things, having equal opportunities. So it kind of, you don't have that massive girls-boys divide okay. that you used to. So um, so that's, you know, that's what I do now. And, and I also know they're much more open. Um, and actually, it's some, part, it's, part it scares me. You know, the, the way they are so open on the mm. sexuality front is sort of 16-year-olds having threesomes. Mm. Um, you know, when I was 16, it was sort of, if you snogged someone, that was like, wow. Mm. Um, so um, I do, yeah, I know that they are, they're very open, they're very, the girls are very sort of, they're not, they're not, they're not into labels. So it's sort of, they're not straight, they're not lesbian, they're kind of, they're much more sort of fluid in that we can try whatever and if we like a girl today or like a boy tomorrow, it's sort of, that's one thing I'm seeing. Okay. And what do you think is important to young people? Um, I think, I, I think you know, that the respect and the boundaries and that actually things mean something. I think actually for young people today, it's less uh, the materialistic side of things. It's that social responsibility. It's that saving the planet. It kind of, they actually, I think they have much more, way more morals actually and responsibility um and knowledge of what's going on in the world um than we ever did okay 
And when you're looking at young people, what do you think has changed about the way they behave and what do you think will change next? Um, as I said, I think they're getting much more socially responsible. Yeah. Um, and they'll think about things. They'll think about what they eat. They think about where they travel. Um, I think, you know, sexually, they'll think more um, about, you know, safety um, and boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to think, you know, the boys <laughs> have much more of that understanding of how to treat girls and that girls have much more of the understanding of their boundaries and that it's their choices and their decisions. Um, okay. Yeah. This is normally the opportunity where I ask people to name and shame uh, brands or organisations that we think get it wrong. Broadly, talking to young audiences about sex and sexuality, do you think brands still get it wrong? Do you think they're getting better? How do you think that? Um, I think, well, I, I um, posted actually in the new, like I saw the new Pampers ad mm. um, last week and I read up about it and that, you know, it's a female director, a female composer and they, it was a board they consulted with and they were all parents working within the ad agency. Mm. And I think, I think it's that side. And as a result, the ad is bang on mm. the difficulties of parenting. Um, so for them, amazing. But I think that you do see a lot that you just know there's a real male presence behind right. ads, um, especially with the women stuff. And it's sort of, I can't think of one in particular. No, that's, I hear you. Funnily enough, the day that we're recording, yesterday was mm. the first day that the ASA banned two ads as a result of gender stereotyping. Oh, which one? There was a, I think it was a Philadelphia ad and one other. Yeah, and I'll be good. <laughs> and it was, and, and so, I mean, actually, I think the most shocking thing wrong with those two ads mm. was that they were really average scripts yeah. as opposed to the gender, gender stereotyping. But there was definitely something there. But you think more broadly when brands are talking to audiences about this sex yeah. and sexuality to listen to the female voice I, more. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think you've got to do... I think brands, people need to do more research mm. and actually have more focus groups and research groups and get people involved in creating these ads and creating the marketing that actually know it. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, we're very big on, you know, before we did our site, it's taken two years to do it. And we've had massive sort of focus groups and research groups and, and surveyed, you know, we had a big 5,000 pool of members that we surveyed across on what they wanted yeah. on it. And I think, um, and so that to, to us, that's a huge thing as knowing what, you know, knowing your audience and knowing, that that's for that messaging and I think especially ad agencies are too quick to think they know everything <laughs> so final two questions then first one is one takeaway for everybody listening about young people or young audiences what would you say um I'd say listen to them okay I think people are too quick to go oh they're children yeah they use they you they haven't they haven't lived they don't know okay um but actually I think they know a hell of a lot more then we give them credit for them. <laughs> and then finally, and I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, um, the screensaver on my iPad yeah. is of my two children wearing a Futurist female uh, T-shirt. Yeah. And my two children got that from Father Christmas, as did I, as did my beautiful wife. <laughs> so Father Christmas is a feminist, we can yeah, confirm that. Yeah, which I noticed on your screen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you said that, Maybe it's the future is female is almost an outmoded message, um, or you were saying that it, we need to continue this message for I, long. Do you know? I'm, I've been slightly disappointed that as females we've only had a short space of time before suddenly sort of um, what your gender, fluid fluidity mm. kind of that gender kind of everything yeah um, has sort of come in and they told trans world which is amazing you know we cater for it as well but suddenly it's sort of you know it's actually there's guys in our changing rooms, mm. and uh, and but we've got to allow that because they're trans, which which is fine. Yeah, on one of them, but it's sort of we've had this very short time of actually going yay females. Yeah, before suddenly it's squashed and it's like no anyone can be a female. Yeah, <laughs> now I understand. Uh, you know, and I don't. You know, if, if I get backlash for that, it's I have no. You know, we our whole business is kind of we get sort of transgender. I've got transgender friends. Um, but, and we joke about it mm. actually together on that front mm. that um, you know men have had centuries 
and women have had about two years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, to me, the future is human. Okay. Emma, where can people find out more about you? Where can people find out more about Killing Kittens? Um, to be honest, uh, either, I mean, killingkittens.com is that is website, and the, but wearekk.com is the site that kind of covers everything. Great. Yeah. Nice one. Emma, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks I really for having me on. It. No worries. <laughs> thank you. I hope you agree that was a great chat, a fascinating conversation, a really awesome guest. If you enjoyed it, let us know. Um, you can get in touch with us across all socials at We Are Rocket or with me directly at James Erskine on Twitter. For more, tune in next week. Uh, we're still in our first season. We're still kind of evolving what we're going to try and do. We know that we want to learn from people in the youth culture, youth marketing space to establish what their rocket fuel is. Give us a five-star review, share the podcast, um, and tune in again next week. Thanks for listening.